Okay, we seem to have steadied off um, in turn of, terms of people joining. So um, welcome to this World CC webinar on the six steps to building an unbeatable contract management business case. Um, today, I've been joined by a number of panelists um, from Inmarsat and Contract Pod AI. So I'm Julian Davis, I'll be your chair for today. Uh, my role is Chief Operating Officer here at World Commerce and Contracting. I'm joined by a panel of three uh, who I will let introduce themselves. So Simon, if we can come to you first, please. Sure, no problem. Hello, everybody. Simon McCarthy. I'm VP of Enterprise Transformation at Contract Pod AI. Been in the contract lifecycle management space now for about 13 years. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and if we can come across to you, Steve. So Steve Eagler, nice to meet you all, Director of Commercial Contracts at Imaset. I've been at Imaset for about coming up to four years now, but I've been drafting and negotiating contracts for well over a decade. So this is somewhat my bread and butter. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, and last, but by no means least, Brody. Hi, everyone. My name is Brody Mulvaney. I am a contract manager here at Inmarsat. I sit under Steve and I'm responsible for the Maritime Business Unit. Great. Thank you very much, Brody. Um, so throughout today's session, you can ask the panel questions by using the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screens. Uh, I will endeavour to keep an eye on the questions that are coming through. I've got the panel open on my screen in front of me. Um, and if those questions are relevant to the conversation, I will try to get those questions uh, asked at that time. Uh, other than that, if I miss the opportunity to ask a question, um, then we will hopefully have some time at the end where we can cover off any remaining questions and answers. So please just keep your questions coming as we go through. Um, so just to set some context for today's discussion, um, if we can move on to the next slide, why do we need a CLM anyway? Well, Contract Pod AI are about to release their white paper, which reveals that without a CLM, teams are missing contractual obligations 75% more than those that have a CLM. Here at World CC, our own benchmark report shows that contract and commercial teams are under pressure to expand their contribution to the business. And this varies from 36% in the procurement areas, rising up to 45% of those people who are supporting sales. So I think given the CLM market size is projected to reach 3.3 billion by 2027, there are obviously a lot of people who think that CLM is a good investment. So, um, just to get things started, um, on before we get on to those six important steps, we have some audience participation for you. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we've got a poll. So what does the term CLM mean to you? You should see a poll screen come up in front of you. So if you could please tick the one that means the most to you in terms of what does the term CLM mean to you? Just wait to uh, um, see when most people have actually voted. While we're just waiting on that, Simon, I'll come to you, actually. Uh, welcome to the webinar, by the way. Um, this might influence the last few stragglers, but what are you expecting to see here in terms of the vote on this poll? I'm expecting the majority to land on a technology solution that supports and enables the contracting life cycle. However, I would anticipate the correct answer to be number one, which is actually the process. Um, contract life cycle management is ultimately the process and mechanism of managing the contract. There are, of course, technology solutions on the market that can fulfill that need. So if we, I don't know if we're able to see the results now of what the poll shows us. Oh, oh. If I was a gambling man, I might be asking for your uh, advice on a horse tomorrow. Look at that. 43% um, is a dead heat on the first two. So 43% of our participants think that the process of gaining clarity and visibility, uh, and as you predicted, 43% also think actually it's more around the technology solution. Um, we did have very few on the, the bottom two there, but there were 12% that thought that it helped in terms of improving decision making. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so if we move on now to uh, the next slide, um, this is step one. 
um, in the six step process. So uh, Simon, I'll stick with you. Uh, this is around educating your stakeholders and what is CLM. So we've just had a poll on what does CLM mean to us. Uh, why is it so important to educate stakeholders on what CLM is? I, th I think, Julian, actually the split in the poll actually gives you some indication there as to there is uncertainty or a lack of clarity as to exactly what CLM means to the business. But I think the other key thing here is, unlike a CRM that gets deployed to primarily the sales function or a P2P platform that gets primarily deployed to procurement, contract lifecycle management actually sits across a wide stakeholder group, both in buy side, sell side, legal, finance, IT, et cetera. So on that basis alone, it's absolutely critical that the wide ranging stakeholder group that's going to get the most from this solution really understands and buys into the journey. Great, thank you, Simon. And Steve, uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, how did you go about educating your stakeholders then? And, and do you have any practical tips for our audience? Uh, yes. Uh, so from our side, we took a look at who's going to be involved from uh, an urgency, influence and power perspective. And we did a little stakeholder salience map to identify all those different categories. And first of all, we identified who's going to be the senior sp uh, sponsor for this program because, you know, they take a lot of the heat internally at executive level and all the different parties that may be touching the system in terms of the sales team, the commercial team, the compliance team, the procurement team and so forth. And we took a look at who are going to be the main users of the system and then the output of the systems as well. And I think it's always worthwhile before you come to these types of projects to identify who are your key stakeholders, who has the power and influence over the over the success of this project and how do you keep them happy and engaged throughout the course of the program. And that is how we work this program through our systems. Okay. And, and Steve, while we're on that, obviously we're talking here, we're looking at what the, the impact of this and efficiencies and that. With those stakeholders, did you have to many manage expectations in terms of uh, what people thought the impact of this would be on headcount? Oh, oh, certainly. So, you know, you speak to the CFO if you're about putting a program like this in place. And the first thing he's going to say is, well, how many heads are we going to save by by using the system. And the reality is it doesn't quite work that way. And one of your slides earlier, it talks about how the commercial and contractual teams now are expected to deliver more value to the business. And that's where I see these platforms really providing value to the business. So, so now we can pivot, uh, we can change terms, we can do a thorough, more thorough analysis on our contractual landscape than we could before, where previously it might take us a few weeks to come to that decision about what our environment looked like. And now we can run using AI a lot of the same questions very quickly. And it enables better decision making long term as well, because people understand what the contractual environment looks like from both supplier and customer side. And we're going to be more and more nimble in, in our environment. And that really matters a lot especially in our market, which is rapidly changing. And it, it means that we can stay effectively at a cutting edge of what other operators like ourselves are providing to market. Okay. So the return on investment isn't always about headcount. It's potentially freeing up the resources to add more value to the organization through other activities. C correct. So, you know, when Excel came in, it didn't mean there was loads of accountants that lost their jobs. It meant those accountants were instead upskilled to a different platform and learned more from it. And I think the same thing from a contract manager perspective. We all know how to negotiate and, and execute contracts, but now we're upskilling to the next level where we can provide more value to the business. And that's where I see tools like this are really powerful for any kind of contract or operational or legal team to, to move that forward. Great. Thank you, Steve. Right. So that's step one, educate your stakeholders. Um, step two. So step two is all about understanding your current contract systems and processes. And Simon, I'll come back to you first on this one. So can you just expand on this a little? Why do we need to understand what we've already got? I think that's it's a great question. And I, I sort of broadly group this into what I would call readiness activities, particularly CLM readiness, which is a a fine art to be mastered. Um, I think the first piece is in terms of understanding current state assessment and ultimately understanding what your target operating model for contracting needs to look like, doesn't matter which technology solution you choose. Doesn't matter whether you choose a technology solution at all. Just having a broad understanding of where you are today, 
and where you want to go tomorrow is ultimately going to inform that process and drive what those functional and non-functional requirements are. I think there's also a, a sort of a, a need or a desire to sort of bring the technology in first and foremost, and that's going to suddenly solve all of your problems. But actually, focus really hard on what are the things that are broken and what are the things that are actually working really well and make sure you fix the broken things or adapt those processes and optimize them before you start implementing the technology. So understanding all of that up front is absolutely critical to that sort of general path to success. You, you don't want to be doing that in the middle of a technology implementation. Right. Thank you, Simon. Steve, I'm going to go out on a wing here and, and suggest that maybe everything wasn't all documented and everything wasn't working well when you embarked on this CLM program. What, what were the biggest challenges you faced? So Imasat is a fairly old company. We were set up in 1979. And so we've got a lot of history and legacy in terms of our contracts. Some contracts were previously held on people's computers. Some people, sometimes it was held on a central database. So understanding that entire con contractual environment is often difficult, first of all. And I always find pulling all of that together before you can move to a new system is, is really crucial because if you don't tidy up your home to begin with, it's not going to be any good when you move. So there's a big piece there to understand what is your contract environment and how to make sure that is best practice before you move to a, a, a CLM system. Now we had record keeping that was fine at the time, but we need to move with the the current times and the current trends and be able to extract more value out of those customer out of those customer contracts and supplier contracts and that's some of the tidy up that we had to do and some of the issues that we face when moving to a new clm system is just working out what's of scope what processes do you want to move forward for what are going to be your workflows that entire contractual landscape from start to finish right thank you steve Brody, welcome to you. Um, I know you're relatively new to InMarsat, but it yeah. might be interesting to understand from you, what do you think some of the biggest challenges and issues that legal departments have been facing in uh, current contract management processes? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I also think it's quite a difficult question to answer because it's quite open-ended. Um, you know, legal departments across the world will have different solutions in place of, of how their contract management system is, you know, works. Um, whether, you know, it, like, like Steve just said, whether it's something quite legacy and there's loads of paper involved or whether you've not necessarily migrated to the, the most up-to-date legal tech yet. Um, so I, th I think it's quite open-ended and difficult to answer that. Um, the short answer, I think, is the fear of migration is probably the biggest problem for legal departments. It's, it, as Steve said, it's a daunting task. It can take years, really, to fully migrate from one solution to another. In some circumstances, it can be expensive. You, you know, it's daunting enough to to you know migrate everything over, let alone to something that you might not necessarily understand. Um, so, so yeah, I think the biggest the biggest sort of issue that these legal departments may be facing is that notion of uh, fear of of migrating um, over to a new platform. Right. Thank you, Brody. OK, so we've talked about educating the stakeholders. We, we've touched on understanding your current systems and processes and making sure you've got those clear. I think the message I took away from that is that is a piece of work you can do before you even need to worry about whether you need a technology solution to help you. Um, before we go on to step three, another poll for you. So um, if we can put the poll up, which team or department do you think will use or uses a CLM solution the most? So if people could select which one they think it is, there's a, a list of uh, six different areas there. I'll give people a, a little while to um, answer those. We'll just check that people are still with us that they're answering the poll. Now, Brody, your camera's gone off. I was going to come to you and ask you this one. Yeah, that's fine. Ah, uh, he's back. So um, we asked Simon the last one. Let's ask you this one. So which team department do you think uses CLM the most? So um, what do you expect people to say on this one? We've got marketing, sales, operations, procurement, 
finance and accounting, IT and legal. And I guess your battery was about to run out, was it? <laughs> yeah, I just had to quickly move um, to, to plug in. Yeah, I think um, the, you know, the sort of gut instinct of people is going to say legal and procurement uh, inherently just due to the nature of, you know, signing contracts and sending them out. Um, it makes the most sense for, for legal to be using it the most. Uh, so I would imagine uh, answers D and G would be the most popular here. Okay, let's have a look at what the result tells us then. What was the most popular here? Wow, you guys are good today. Um, look at that, procurement and legal, 44% people said procurement, 31% said legal. So 75%, three quarters of our participants think it's procurement and legal, closely followed by the operations and supply chain team. So yes, bang on. Right, if we move on to step three, um, this is around uh, knowing your audience. So we've got a lot of departments and roles listed here. Um, Steve, I'll come to you if I may. Um, looking at all of those roles we've got there, how important is it for um, a project like this to have internal champions? Oh, crucial. Those top guys are the ones that take a beating from other senior stakeholders. And so it's really crucial to get a senior spoke spokesman and sponsor for this program that will move things forward for you. Inevitably, there's gonna be issues along the line in terms of integration or moving forward or resources. And so for us, we need a senior stakeholder for, for any program of this kind of magnitude. And whether that is CFO or someone a CIO or the general counsel, I don't think it matters too much, but you need someone at least at an executive level to sponsor the program. Okay. And, you know, not everyone's going to be an advocate from the outset here. I'm presuming you were no different. Did you face challenges of getting some people on board and how did you overcome them? Definitely. Uh, some people don't like to change. And so it's understanding what those issues are that people have, and then trying to try to kind of nudge them along to a different path of thinking so that they become aligned with what the vision is and bring people in early. That's what I would always recommend. And the more they can get involved and feel part of that process, the more they're going to be invested and want to move forward with you. You're always going to get some stakeholders that will complain, you know, either that it's not returning as much money or, you know, the business case doesn't work or their the current platform is great and why do we need to change? But, you know, every company does change over time. The change happens through people. Sometimes it's all organic and people get nudged along, or sometimes there's a major event that makes you need to change. Um, for Imasat, it was more that we knew we needed to change. Our other old CLM system really wasn't fit for purpose. We knew that in order to compete with some of the best contracts, legal and procurement teams around the, around the world, we needed an updated CLM. So we had more of a, you know, we need to change versus, you know, should we change? Uh, and you know, getting those stakeholders as part of the story early is is what I would really recommend doing. Thank you, Steve. Simon, just coming to you. So, you, as as a solution provider, you you all have been through this a number of times, and I imagine that inevitably you've seen organisations with differing levels of engagement. Do you have any examples or stories to share about the good, the bad, and the ugly? Certainly do. Um, I think the key word that Steve mentioned there was change. You know, this 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 comes as a journey and evolution and a need to adopt and, and embrace change. And you can only do that with this cross-functional group of senior stakeholders invested. And if we look at the statistics, you know, at least 70% of technology transformation programs fail. And in my experience, that is rarely to do with the technology itself. It's usually those two pieces, one of which we discussed earlier, which is around readying yourself for this level of transformation and doing the groundwork to define what good looks like before you procure the tech. And then the other piece is the change and adoption journey and making sure that everybody's bought into it. And if those two pieces are not in unison with the technology, then it's not going to be a success. And different levels of maturity, you know, sometimes in 
in, in large enterprise deals, you'll have all of these stakeholders, you'll have program managers assigned, change managers assigned, everybody knows their place and role in that. An implementation partner will be engaged to bolster that team and provide all of the, the arms and legs to make this thing happen. Um, in smaller organizations, typically, but not always the case, it may well be that you've got sort of a one person army that's trying to draw all of these resources together and deliver this change into the business. Um, what that often looks like from a from a CLM implementation perspective is that the, the GC is wearing the, the project manager's hat. They're trying to try to make all the design decisions. They're trying to get the thing up and running. They end up being the uh, the sort of train the trainer. And it's a huge burden for those individuals to take on outside of the day to day remit of their role and their day job. Um, so having this audience who fully embrace and understand the scale of the deployment, particularly the IT function, who are so critical in putting those bodies in place to make sure that these types of transformation programs are a success is critical. Um, plus, what what the CFO wants from the solution is, is very different to what the CIO wants, what the general counsel wants. And you, you can see some of obviously those benefits up on the screen. Um, and you really achieve the success of this type of program when all of those folks are satisfied that they're getting the value that they need. Thank you, Simon. And Brody, back to you from a, um, a business perspective as 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 Simon's quite rightly said there's a large list of benefits up here. Um, since you've been with Inmarsat, have you seen evidence of some of these materialising? Yeah, for sure. I think um, the the thing that I really felt um, the moment I joined Inmarsat compared to, say, previous roles that I've had is the, the time saved from an admin perspective. Um, that you know, ability to save time on what would have been slightly more mundane, less sort of revenue generating activity tasks compared to, you know, negotiating contracts or sending them out for signature um, makes the team have mo uh, more momentum and is, is a little bit more efficient. Um, so for me, that was, I think, something that was um, really noticeable when I first joined in Marsat. Um, secondly to that, because we're saving more time through the solution that we've implemented, it enables, at least in Marsat in this case, to use that sort of free time to train employees up to, you know, a, a higher standard across sort of other areas of the business. Um, and because of that, I'm more well-rounded in my job role. Um, and essentially that's all stemmed from the back of a CLM solution. Um, so sort of as Simon said there, that these benefits, you know, are kind of different across whether it's a CEO or general counsel. Um, the overarching benefit, I think, is the same. You know, it, it's performance, right? And, you know, it, it sort of lifts everyone up, um, even those that don't use it. Um, if I'm able to learn something that I wasn't able to because I've saved some time, um, I might be able to affect a stakeholder that would never see the CLM. So in a weird way, that CLM solution has actually, you know, impacted someone internally that has never seen it or used it. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the power of these types of legal tech solutions is that they have a bit of a domino effect um, with, it, with inside an organization. Um, and I think that's something that I've seen sort of pretty early on from, from joining in Marsat, yeah. So got a, got a, a live question coming up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this out, but Simon, if I can come to you first, or it's a two-parter really. So it's saying uh, the first part was really about are there time savings in procurement from going from manual to using a CLM? And, and the second part of the question is, is there any kind of statistics or average time savings that people see by doing this? Great, great questions. And I think we're going to be touching on sort of ROI in a, in a moment. But um, specifically on those questions, I mean, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the key piece from my perspective is there's been a lot of focus on the pre-execution stages of the contracting workflow. Um, when we think about CLM technology, we're often thinking about drafting contracts, approving them, negotiating them, getting them signed. And you can absolutely put time savings around that in terms of you know, the automation accelerates the time to generate the draft. You're able to use AI and other tools to empower the business to make more informed decisions quickly, all of those good things. Um, what I would call, broadly speaking, operational efficiencies. However, those efficiencies alone might not stack up and, and, and complete your business case. Um, and ultimately, looking at those in isolation, you know, CLM technology is, depending on the, the, the vendor, can be very, very expensive. So ultimately, 
focusing more on the post signature is where you will typically find potentially the business case and the savings that you're looking for. So there are statistics out there in the in the broader marketplace that's, that suggest that organizations lose somewhere between eight and nine percent um, in, in commercial leakage, either through, well, essentially through post post signature management of the contract, ineffective post signature management of the contract. And obviously, from a procurement perspective, that could be that you're essentially overspending. Um, uh, and, and obviously, on the sales side, that could be that you're you're simply not charging your customers what, what, what you should be. Um, now, our experience says that it's not that much. It's not eight to nine percent. I mean, experience says it's more like somewhere between three to five percent. But if you look broadly at your overall uh, revenue stream and your overall spend, what does three to five percent equate to you as a business? What does one percent equate to you as a business? And that number alone could be sufficient enough to drive the whole value proposition around around the CLM. So I would think I would leave no stone unturned in terms of the the post signature obligation management and effectively managing the contract after it's been signed. Great, Simon. And that leads us nicely out of step three and, and on to step four, which is all around that return on investment. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll come to you, Steve, on this one first, if I may. So how did you go about demonstrating um, adding CLM technology would impact your bottom line? Uh, and when when did you expect to see a positive return on that? Yeah, great question. So Simon talked about how this is broken down into pre-contract and post-contract. Pre-contract, yes, we are saving some time in terms of signing contracts quicker, bringing revenues in faster or making faster procurement deals. But really that for us wasn't what turned the needle in terms of an ROI. So for us, most of the work and value came in post-contract where it came to the point where now, well, now you can use AI to do a discovery search of all your contracts, you know, the plethora of contracts that you have are in the system, and you can then run diagnostics on that. Now, look, most teams don't have the stamina to go through 10,000 contracts and give you an accurate summary of what it entails. Well, now you can do it with a click of the button, depending upon the system that you're using, and that's the value that you can then provide. And that then means that you're not maintaining legacy systems where you're trying to build this information in manually you can just do a lot of that automation and we calculated that we would have an ROI of about 27 percent on annualized return and in terms of break-even time it took would, would take between two and three years um, before it would start to break even and then after that we're, we're positive no change in headcount I believe that though we deliver more value to the organization of what we what details we can provide and we can drive better decision making from that. So in a lot of regards, we've been upskilled by moving to a better technology platform. Great. Thank you, Steve. Brody, coming to you again. Um, are there tools that we can use then out there to try and measure the impact of a CLM on the bottom line? So some way in which we can actually put some tangible numbers on this? Yeah, I think, um, again, it, it can be a bit of an open ended one, depending on the solution that you have. Um, you know, as sort of Simon sort of referred to earlier, there's so many different solutions at different costs out there on the market that are going to offer sort of different, you know, reporting tools or dashboards uh, that will calculate that, you know, your, the effect on, on your bottom line. Um, I think, you know, it, for example, the one in Marsat uses, um, we can pull really detailed reports really quickly across 10,000, 20,000 contracts. And that enables us to see what contracts are expired. Maybe we want to search by jurisdiction. Maybe we want to uh, search by revenue. Um, so, for example, the other day I was tasked with pulling the top 10 revenue um, contracts. I was able to do it within seconds. Um, and I think, you know, when you're able to do that, it's not necessarily the direct impact that it has on your bottom line, but it's what comes from that. So being able to pull these reports and sort of extracting this data enables us to strategically alter our, our route of sort of plan of action on how we're going to get contracts re-signed, renegotiated, improved. 
um, and, and it makes life a lot easier. Um, for example, Steve just did a bit of a project where he was um, improving all contractual templates and um, being able to sort of pull data from dashboards and um, from our CLM solution, it's a lot easier to do that because we can look at legacy contracts really easily without digging through old paper filing cabinets and things like that. So in terms of direct bottom line impact, you know, of course, there's, there's going to be ways, you know, like, like Simon said, you can look at the post post signature value of re-signing and that sort of contract management uh, post signature. Um, but for me, I think the values in the, the ability to extract data really quickly, and it's how you use that data is where, where it becomes valuable. Um, you know, it's all good having all the tools in the shed, but if, unless you know how to use them all, then it, you know, it kind of doesn't matter. Right. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's how you use that data, how you can implement that data into maybe third party software, such as Salesforce or something like that. Um, and, and, and how you use that data to then, to then affect the bottom line. Yeah. Great. And on that point, coming back to you, Simon, then just to finish off on this step four. So, um, uh, again, thinking of your broader experience of different organisations, do you see any difference in in what people use as ROI between the size of the organisation, the industry they're in, the, the, the geography? Yes, absolutely. So, for example, uh, it, it could be that an organisation has had a red flag on an audit and it doesn't, you know, when I sit down with a customer at the beginning of the journey to understand how and where we start the implementation, um, in that scenario, it doesn't really matter what, what my point of view is on what success looks like, because ultimately there is a directive to resolve the red flag on the audit. And so all focus is on that. And in some regards, then the business case is predicated on having to address that need. So sometimes events happen that force somebody into that particular situation. Other times, it's a risk mitigation uh, scenario whereby we're mindful that the audit could happen or we're mindful of our exposures. Um, we know that there is something leaving the building that is either non-compliant or is creating some kind of loophole for us. And we need the tools and technology in place to try and close those gaps to demonstrate compliance internally. So again, putting a tangible number on that is sometimes harder. But being able to actually demonstrate that I'm doing everything within my power to make sure that I'm not letting those things slip through the net is equally um, important. And Brody touched upon this piece around iterative improvement. Um, once you've got something inside a solution like this, you're then able to analyze it in a way that allows you to say, do you know what, looking at the data, this particular template is always using this clause, but the data is telling me that every single time we end up with fallback number five. So why do I elongate my negotiation cycles? It's because of every single time we're going through that process. Let's optimize our templates to include that language from the beginning of the process so that we're then contracting the overall time to value, time to negotiate, et cetera. So you, you don't have those benefits. You don't have the opportunity to create that competitive advantage within the organization if you don't have that data available to you in the first instance. So part of it is the journey to getting into the system. The other part of it is what ROI can I actually uh, create once it's in there as well? Don't, don't overlook once it's in there, what else can I do with it and how can that bring about benefits? Um, another key piece is around retention rates and staff satisfaction levels. Um, you know, if we think about the fact that, um, uh, in, in a in a in this environment with with legal ops professionals, legal teams, scaling businesses, um, I want to work in an environment where I'm technology enabled. I want to work in an environment where I get value from the tools and and, and the day to day environment that I work in. So I think those things are that they're perhaps softer benefits, um, but those can can critically be overlooked as well, and they they obviously bring about huge benefits to an organisation as well. Great, thank you for that, Simon. So that's step four. If we move on to step six, uh, five out of six, sorry, um, which is around sharing the business benefits um, when building the case. So Steve, if I can come to you on this one, uh, we've got a number of benefits highlighted here. Were there um, any benefits that uh, materialised that were unexpected for you? Actually, Simon just took, talked about one. Um, 
Staff engagement is a funny one. So before we had some of these tools and technology, we'd always get the, the usual thing in our staff surveys that there's too much admin part of the role. You know, I spend half my life filing away contracts and uh, trying to find contracts and you know putting information within an Excel sheet or a table. And people really didn't like doing that. And I'm honest, I don't think anyone really likes doing it, if I'm being completely frank. And it was notable that these comments kept coming up. Well, now we've moved to a new technology, we're getting a lot less of those kind of comments. And the actually the actual score is actually remarkably increased. It was around kind of six, and now it's in kind of the eight numbers. And a lot of this is down to how people enjoy their work. And that's not something I really appreciated about the level of effort and admin that was in the team that's now been saved the new platform. And it enables people to stop worrying about all of the admin tasks they were doing before and burning up or burning the midnight candle as it were and actually focusing on their day job and creating value and the other thing is that i've noticed is that previously we were quite a reactive team well now we are much more proactive so we work very closely with the commercial and sales and all the other kind of teams and they come to us asking for data as opposed to the other way around and that's because we can provide them the level of data they're looking for so that we can drive the best decision making and and i see those kind of the two differences that we were from day one to today and i didn't actually expect it i more expected that okay it's going to save me some time i didn't expect all those other value-added services that kind of came out of it and the fact that we are growing within the organization and we're becoming a real stakeholder as part of that which is you know really important for any contract manager or procurement leader that want to want to kind of show their worth within any organization right and Brody, have you are you um, seeing that um, in terms of the day to day responsibilities that you and your colleagues are, have? Are you seeing the CLM is is changing what you have to do? Yeah, I think it's important to note that I haven't been at Inmarsat before the solution was implemented, so I can't really offer an accurate sort of before and after perspective. Maybe like Steve can. Um, with that being said, though, what I can do is compare post solution, uh, as I am here within Marsat, to previous employers where there maybe wasn't a solution, or if there was, it wasn't as advanced as the one we have. Um, again, the short answer is yes. And Steve has kind of taken the words right out of my mouth in terms of the admin um, is, I think, the most notable thing. Um, again, like Steve said, no one really wants to waste time just inputting data into an Excel sheet or uploading documents manually one by one by one, searching for an hour just to find one contract, to find one clause. No no one wants to do that, whether it's the individual or the business, because it's not cost effective. Um, so, so yeah, I think the the day-to-day -day responsibilities have changed because my time is more free, which gives me more time, uh, like I said previously, to become highly skilled in other areas, be trained up in other areas, and to focus more on things like the actual negotiations with customers, which, you know, that you could argue there's a tertiary impact of sort of customer satisfaction, then if I'm able to spend more time with customers. Um, so yeah, again, as a day to day, I think because the time is being saved, and I'm more efficient as an employee, that makes me more skilled as an employee it makes customers happy it makes internal stakeholders happy and i'm not spending hours upon hours a week um you know doing sort of more laborious tasks that um i guess could be and are automated um so yeah good and steve i'll just come back to you to close on this one so have you had to change any of your your contracting styles or anything since adopting the clm the short answer is no, we can input all of our templates, but what we have used, and I'll give you a bit of a plug here, Julian, is that the World CC um, kind of body of knowledge in terms of how to best draft a contract. And we've really taken that to town, as it were, to, to make and enable our contracts to be automated. Look, no AI system is going to be able to generate a complete contract for you. Even ChatGPT can't do that quite yet, but you're going to have to put some of the methodology there in place. So make it very easy to read. Try to use as much, you know, standard English as possible if it's going to be based in English. Make that make there some free text fields that can be auto-populated by AI information based upon the parameters of the contract. And so we've really used the WellCC here to help us draft and 
put together a really nice looking contract. Now that really helps speed up contracting. And the other benefit is that from a customer and procurement perspective, it's easier for them to sign. They know exactly what they're signing up to. They know exactly what the rights and obligations are and just makes every party clear about what they're you know, what they're signing up to and what the contractual obligations are and so we've we if you haven't already that's why i would recommend in terms of taking a look at your next step if you know that your templates need updating great thank you very much steve right so final final step step six in terms of building this business case uh creating urgency with a solid action plan simon i'll start with you here so can you set some expectations about what people should be looking to put in place here in terms of to move forward? Yes, absolutely. So I, I touched upon earlier the sort of significance of having dedicated program management, dedicated change management, uh, regardless of the size of the organisation. Um, I would liken a CLM deployment to some of those uh, perhaps more painful experiences that you've had in the past where you've deployed a, a large scale ERP solution or a P2P platform or a CRM. And when you do those, everybody seems to acknowledge they're, they're big, hefty programs. They can last many years. To Steve's point, they can take time to, 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 to return on investment. Um, with CLM, there's sort of a misconception, I think, that it's kind of you buy it off the shelf and you you, you stick it into the to the enterprise and it's up and running in three months. Um, it's just absolutely not the case. It's it's on the same scale as those other enterprise technology uh, deployments, and it has to integrate with all of those deployments as uh, in, in, in all of those applications as well. So. Now, I think setting that expectation up front that this is going to be a multi-phase journey, you've got to really focus on what does success look like, but also how do we deliver value iteratively and quickly. Contract migration that Brody mentioned earlier, classic example, you know, if I've got, let's say, big number, 100,000 contracts, if you decide that phase one is all about taking those 100,000 contracts and putting them into the platform, you can do that, but that's going to take time. And you've got to think very carefully about your stakeholder management, what, what we discussed earlier, because if you're reporting up to your steer co every month that we're still migrating, we're still migrating, we're still mi when are you unlocking value from this process? So one of the key things is focusing on how and when I bring capabilities and features and functions into the mix. I don't have to migrate everything in one go. There's actually benefits from migrating and automating on a contract type by contract type basis, because the process of automating the contract type can inform the data that you want from the old one. So there's there's lots of things to consider as part of that action plan. Um, very, very much focus on where are the integration touch points. You know, most of these users want to be met in the environment that they're most familiar. So if I'm the salesperson, maybe that's Microsoft Dynamics, maybe that's salesforce.com. Um, as the legal professional, I probably want to be interacting with these documents in Microsoft Word. So thinking about what all of that deployment looks like um, and all of those integrations to flow into the downstream transactional systems, that's absolutely critical. And of course, you layer on top of that, that change journey that we discussed earlier. And that change and adoption plan should really start right from the very outset of you embarking on this journey. So if you're thinking about procuring a CLM, tell the business that that's what you're doing. When you've procured one, let them know that you've done it and start showing them what it is and why it's going to be important to you. Um, the anecdotal example I always use about, about this type of stuff is, when uh, my team goes and delivers training and we had one scenario where we went to deliver the end user training and we had about 25 people from the customer show up and the first question they said is what CLM and why am I here so for the change journey to have broken down that spectacularly um, you know that's that six months lost now where you've got to re-engage them to get them to a point where they're ever going to even consider buying into it so build that action plan up front Think about it as a phased incremental rollout. We often talk about cruel walk run and, and unlock value quickly. That's key. Right. And I'll just refer people back to step one that we talked about right at the very beginning here on Simon's point there. All right. Educate your stakeholders. Absolutely key. Um, Steve, I'm going to come to you and just pick up on, on what Simon touched on there about integration and, and the top point there, the bullet point. How difficult will this be integrate with your current estate? So, um, how difficult was it? What are you integrating? 
<laughs> so look, if you're using a standalone platform where people are just using it to record their contracts, it's fairly easy. But if you want it to do anything more that, and that's when you, I think that's when you start extracting the value, like you're integrating it with Salesforce, you go through to DocuSign, you do the full end-to-end -end picture. Well, now that's where the value comes out of it because you're starting to streamline a lot of these work processes and it also enables um, some more self-serve. So now some of the sales guys could do some of the more mundane contract tasks that may have been done by the contracts team if we put the right parameters in place and that becomes a bit more difficult because now you start need to think about well what's the template going to look like how what information is going to be inputted into the template uh, what kind of record keeping do we want from that and where's that front end system going to uh, live and we've done a lot of work with contract pod and salesforce to help automate that and smooth that passage but that's not an easy task and it requires a significant amount of user acceptance testing. So that's the piece I would always recommend any team does is build in a big old buffer for user acceptance testing before you go live. First of all, you get more time for your teams to understand what the platform is like, what the quirks are of the system. And look, every system has slightly different quirks. No system will be perfect or out of the box. And does it fit your operational need? And build, as I said, build buffer in because there will be things that come up. Don't just leave a week for it and then hope for the best before you go live. And that gives you then enough time in order to get a big group of people that understand the system. So then that also then helps with training for when you do go live, that it's not a mad panic day one where you switch on the system and go, good luck, guys, hope for the best. So now you're actually bringing along people, other people kind of disseminate that information within the organization and it gets the right people trained up. So really think about what are you trying to get out of the system we wanted to integrate it with as many platforms as possible so picking a vendor that has an open api that's really helpful but if you're a smaller case and you only want to use it as standalone well you know that might be an easier case but really work with your vendor to understand what the capabilities are before you down select great thank you very much steve brody i'll i'll, I'll come to you next um so how do you think the CLM platform is going to impact people's roles moving forward? What's the potential there? Yeah, that's a, a really, really good question. And I think that's something that a lot of people are thinking about in just the legal tech world as, as a general right now. You know, Steve mentioned it earlier with the rise of things like ChatGPT. I think a lot of people are conscious of this idea of these automated and, you know, artificial intelligence systems sort of lowering headcounts um personally i don't think that's necessarily true um i think your workforce becomes more skilled and it's just a new skill set that you have um when it comes to being em em employable for for um this type of industry uh, for example um let's say three years ago or two years ago when i was looking at a contract manager related role I might not have, and I didn't really have much CLM experience. Um, you know, if and whenever I move on from Inmarsat, I think I'm going to be more employable because I am able to say that I went through the tail end of a migration. I can understand the CLM from start to finish. I can understand how to extract data. And I think that's, that's how it's going to impact jobs, right? Is these people are going to learn a new skill set that is going to be valuable to organizations across all sizes. Um, and I think that's something that is quite valuable to touch on as well, is that, you know, these solutions necessarily aren't just made for, you know, absolutely huge global international organizations, right? You can you can benefit from CLM solutions even as a small business. Um, like Simon said earlier, whether that's you just start automating a certain process and, you know, you slowly catch up. Um, but I think having the awareness of, of what legal tech is out there, how to use it, um, and and how to migrate it if if needed is is how jobs are going to change. Um, people are going to be more skilled in and around the core responsibilities of contract management, um, and I think that's that's going to be the impact on jobs. I think employers are going to want to see that more. Great, thank you, Brody. Right, so um, I've got one or two questions left on my sheet, uh, but I've got a number that have come through from the audience. So let's let's go through those and uh, then, guys, I'll come back to you and just give you 30 seconds just to give your closing comments and remarks at the end. So 
I'll, I'll just nip through the questions. The first one was, are you able to share tech solutions available for CLM? Well, of course, contract powered AI would be my obvious answer. Um, if you wanted to look wider than that, um, I personally would recommend getting to one of World CC's conferences where contract pod AI and a whole host of other CLM providers are there and they can uh, demonstrate their products to you and get live demos uh, on the exhibition stands. So, um, and, Julian, we did the exact same thing. We went through the vendor and we sent out a number of RFIs to lots of different vendors, but we used World CC to help us with that. Perfect. There you go. Thank you, Steve. Um, can quick one here, can the technology solution include the relevant processes on the CLM? Simon? Yeah, so I suppose ultimately the CLM is designed to come out of the box with a predefined workflow, but that can then be configured to meet your needs. Some CLMs come with a blank canvas. I don't necessarily like that because then it's kind of what do you want and then you can kind of create spaghetti. Um, what I like to do is try and be very prescriptive and say based on hundreds of customer implementations, you know, the common MSA workflow is set up like this. And then it's a case of validating that with you to understand why that wouldn't work for you. And what that tends to do is cut through the noise of we've always done things this way. Uh, we tend to get to an answer far quicker based on sort of broad customer feedback. Great. Thank you, Simon. Right, I'm going to come to the next one. I'm aware we've got about eight minutes left and we've probably got a similar number of questions. So I'll come to each of you in turn on this one. If you can give me uh, two answers each, please, that would be great. So the question is, I'm working on creating a survey to our internal business partners regarding their current CLM experience. Do you have any suggestions regarding what types of questions I should ask them? I'm the legal ops manager for our general counsel department. Simon, got two questions? Uh, well, um, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, yeah, that, that is a big question. I mean, ultimately, I think it's about understand. I mean, I'd need to understand the maturity of the organization to, to be able to provide a, a comment on exactly what to ask. But I think in the round, you do need to understand. I, I think about this actually as the emotion journey that these individuals go through if you think about this in terms of happy emojis uh, neutral emojis and sad emojis uh, trying to lay out a series of questions at each maybe stage of the contracting life cycle to understand where do they land and where do they sit on that emotional journey um, you'll typically find that uh, the legal team might have a very happy experience at a certain point in the process but the procurement team that might be the biggest pain point so I, I would try and think about it in terms of the stages of the life cycle uh, and where there might be pain or opportunities to improve right okay we'll leave that one there um Brody let me come to you next um what tasks do you find yourself being able to do now to add value to the business that you couldn't do or had no time for before yeah thanks for the question Matt I think that that's a that's a really good one um, sort of touched on it earlier, but I'll sort of reiterate. Um, the time that I can save due to the automation of a CLM solution allows me as an employee to communicate and learn from other stakeholders uh, within Inmarsat. Uh, so a quick example of that would be I had a meeting with the people that essentially plan and build the satellites that we launch into space. Um, totally different part of the business. I would never really communicate with them. But because, you know, I now have a little bit more time free, I'm able to allocate that time to learning more about areas of the business that I necessarily wouldn't have exposure to. And um, the value of that is your workforce becomes more knowledgeable about your business, you know, from sort of end to end, um, which again improves efficiency. Um, and I think, you know, to me, that was something that I found really insightful and really felt the value from. So, right. Yeah. Thank you, Brody. Steve, I'm going to come to you for one now. Um, Colette's asking, uh, what pr training programme was offered to staff outside of the commercial team and who delivered it? So you really think about who's going to have access to this platform and what platform they need access to. So, so I'm just going to take on Simon's question. I would, first of all, ask, what platform does this CLM vendor work with? So if it's Salesforce, as an example, and your commercial teams are used to using Salesforce, I would argue, well, how do those two systems integrate with one another so that you don't have to retrain your 
teams using Salesforce to understand another platform like Contract Pod. Because if the systems can work together, you can pull information or push, push information from one system to another. And so understanding what systems they have access to already, and there you'd be able to identify what platforms they have access to. In terms of the, the, the training, work with your vendor, ask them, well, you know, in terms of your price, how many training sessions do I get out of this? What kind of numbers? What time zones will it be done in? Um, you know, are, if, do I have any follow up questions? What happens? The manual and so forth. Really push your vendor to identify those questions when you're asking them at an RFI or RFP stage. Great. Uh, Simon, let me come back to you. A uh, question from Linda. She wants to know if there's a, a threshold of contracts, a number of contracts in an organization that would trigger a CLM solution, solution i.e. is there a number where it's just too small or low number where it's not viable? Uh, I've implemented CLM for one contract in the past. Uh, that was a monster contract, uh, a tri-party agreement with thousands and thousands of obligations. And the sole purpose of the deployment was just to manage the contractual obligations between those three parties. Um, and it was deemed such a high value contract um, that it, it, it couldn't have been done any other way. So I would say on, on that basis alone, volume is not important. I think it's more about risk appetite, um, compliance, making sure that you can defend yourself in times of need um, and if you need all of those things then whether it's one or a hundred or a hundred thousand i think you need to weigh that up and see great thank you simon brody let me come back to you um question here around clm would it apply to epc companies with long-term contracts yeah so assuming that you're referring to engineering procurement and construction firms and companies i, I think the answer is yes um you know any sort of company or organization that really heavily relies on contracts, I think can benefit from CLM solutions. Um, a really brief example of I think how far this can go is I used to work for a social media influencer agency. Um, they could have benefited from using a CLM solution. Um, and their contracts, I imagine, would be a lot smaller than, say, those of longer term construction contracts. Uh, so the answer is yes. I think any organization that relies heavily on contracts can benefit from CLM solutions. Great. Uh, we're running out of time. Um, I will just come for one more. Uh, Simon, let's go for an efficient CLM should ultimately help in gaining better control over managing vendors and relationships. What's your view on that? 100%. So that data that you now have is going to allow you to make more strategic and informed decisions about who you contract with, why you contract with them. Is there a price escalation that was missed? Did my supplier consistently fail to deliver, which entitles me to something the next time I renew? All of those things are empowered through this technology solution. And I can only see that becoming more and more to the forefront as organizations are compelled to demonstrate their ESG agenda and their compliance to ESG initiatives and the relationships that they form with other parties. Great. OK, one last question before we wrap up to you, Steve. Um, so I'm sure you'd love to, but if you could do this all again, uh, what would you do differently and what lessons could you share with the audience? So what I do differently, I would probably realize that it's more difficult than you really think it is to implement a system. So, you know, you need stamina for some of these systems to be able to get them through working with stakeholders, making sure everyone's engaged and happy. Um, so, you know, going into something more eyes open understanding it's not so easy it's not off the shelf you do need to customize it you do need to work with your vendor very closely to make sure you have a really good system and also i talked about user acceptance testing put some buffer in whatever you have planned put more buffer in times it by one and a half if you have to to make sure that you do have the great a great system for when you go live and that really that's really key because if your stakeholders come to use the system for day one and it's not working as you have claimed it would do, and it's not operationally delivering value, then they are going to lose heart and you're going to lose face in organizations. So just make sure that you can project manage it well and understand that this isn't an easy task you're gonna be able to get done in a weekend. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Well, I'm afraid we're, we're running out of time. Um, we've got a number of questions that remain unanswered here. 
Um, sorry for that. What I would suggest to anyone who has wants to discuss this further, uh, World CC, we have a community platform where you can network and engage with your peers um, and continue these conversations. So get onto that platform, uh, ask the questions on there, and some of your peers in the industry uh, use their experience and their their uh, previous um, implementation experience around CLM, and hopefully they can provide you some advice and answer some questions. I know the community is a great place for exchanging those thoughts and ideas. Um, so thank you to my panel for today. That's been Simon, Steve and Brody. Thanks to you. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, and I hope to see you on a webinar shortly. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, folks. Thanks all. Take care. Thanks, bye.